Well, good afternoon. I'm, I'm glad that you decided to come to what I think is one of the more important uh, of these breakout sessions uh, with one of the more important people in the libertarian movement. Uh, Michael Cloud is a guy I've known for many, many years. I think we met somewhere back around 1980 or something like that. And here is this young, brash, very energetic kid at uh, the National Convention who just seemed to have good stuff to say and interesting ways to say it. And so <clears throat> I thought I'd get to know him a little better, and I have. And we have, in fact, become uh, great friends over the years. And I think it's kind of one of those mutual respect things. Uh, we get along very well, and, and like what I like what he does, and he seems to like what I do. Uh, how many of you saw the keynote address today? Yesterday. Oh, was that yesterday? The keynote address. You saw it today, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was on film already. It's probably on YouTube already. Uh, well, if you saw the keynote, uh, you saw Michael's energy and his enthusiasm, uh, the knowledge that he has about libertarianism and his commitment to libertarian principles, and especially what it takes to communicate uh, libertarianism well. So it should be no surprise for you to learn that he is a recipient of the Thomas Paine Award uh, for great libertarian communicators. Harry Brown said, Michael Cloud is the master of libertarian persuasion. And Harry knew what he was talking about. Michael is the author of a book called Secrets of Libertarian Persuasion. And now, just fresh off the press, his new book, Unlocking More Secrets of Libertarian Persuasion. And I think Mike will tell you a little more about that, uh, that book uh, in, in his discussion. Michael has uh, conducted, led and conducted seminars for libertarian candidates, especially in communication, running campaigns, and especially fundraising. And I think uh, there may be more of those uh, seminars or workshops coming up in the near future. Is that right, Michael? Okay. And uh, if you have an opportunity to get to one of those, that's, that'll be great. But for today, we'll give you, this will be a little bit of an advance on that. Uh, Michael's topic today is fundraising. The title of his talk is How to Easily Raise $10,000 for Your LP Campaign in Just Four Evenings. Here he is, Michael Cloud. How many of you are candidates for office this year? Thank you. Thank you for being candidates. I'm going to make you an offer that you'd have to be a fool to refuse. You'd have to be a Republican or a Democrat. Here's my offer to you. I'm going to teach you how to raise the first $10,000. I'm going to coach you. And I want you to succeed so much that I'm going to coach you personally during your campaign to make sure you raise the first 10000 What I'm going to ask for that in return, just so you know nothing's free, is a note telling people how well it worked for you. Did it work? Was it hard? Was it easy? Just report the truth. I don't want you to, if you finish it and you go, my God, I would rather get root canal than ever do anything with Michael Cloud, you go right ahead and say it. Now, I'm not going to publish that one. <laughs> but my motive is real simple. This year, my commitment to you is, if you're a candidate and you're willing to raise 10000 if this makes sense, I want you to take a look at it before you decide whether or not you want to agree to do it. Does that make sense? I want you to take it out for a test drive and go, wow, that looks great, or oh my God, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now, if you're saying that's the dumbest thing you've ever heard in my life, you're probably my brother or my sister, because no matter what I say, it's the dumbest thing they've ever heard in their life. That's part of being family, isn't it? They don't let you get too big for your britches. Sometimes they even take them in a little bit for you. Now, I want to share some ideas with you that have really worked for a number of people. How do I know they worked? Because I've never had a libertarian fail to do this fundraising. Never. 
I want you to know I've done this with over 300 libertarians, and every single one of them has succeeded. I have a vested interest in you succeeding. I'm not going to let you ruin my perfect record. I want you to know why this is important, so I want to share this with you. Here's the question I want to ask, and I want your answer. Why don't libertarians fundraise? Why don't you fundraise? Why haven't you already fundraised 10,000? And I'm, I'm not looking to make anybody wrong. There are reasons. Like, first reason most people give is, well, I don't know how. Has that occurred to you? Like, well, I'd like to, but I, how do I do it? What are the things that come up? What have kept you from doing the fundraising? What are the things that said, gee, I'd like to, but? Yes, sir. Not known enough, enough people. Okay, that's a very good. That's right. If you get convicted of virtue in the Republican Party, that could ruin everything. <laughs> oh, I, I know what you mean. I had, I had a candidate for uh, a libertarian office, a party office, say, you know, if you donate less than this amount of money, no one will know you gave to my campaign. And my response was, well, then I'll have to give more because I don't give my money secretly. If I make a decision, I'm willing to stand and deliver. Maybe you think I'm right, maybe you think I'm wrong. Scott Stewart, Scott, I donated to your campaign, didn't I? I know the man, I trust the man, I knew he was doing a good job in office. What else would I do? Now, Tony, what's another reason? Yes. Nobody ever asked me to. I've been to libertarian campaign seminars that go like this. Welcome to our libertarian campaign seminar. This is being taught by people who have never run a libertarian campaign. They're Democrats and Republicans who have it what we call really good. They don't know what you're up against as a libertarian party candidate, but they're going to give you advice that you can't possibly follow. Now, let me tell you about these people. This man just got out of prison. He was doing time, but was for a nonviolent offense. With the early work release, this person will teach you all about libertarian campaigning. John Jones here will help you with your bookkeeping. A former convicted embezzler, he's going to help you learn how to do it right. I've been to numerous campaigns where the people teaching them have never walked in your shoes. I'm going to tell you a couple stories that you need to know. Dr. Ron Paul, how many of you know Dr. Paul? How many have given money to Dr. Paul? I have. I did. I re-registered so I could vote for Paul in the primary, and then I immediately took a shower and re-registered a libertarian. <laughs> hey, a man's got standards, but Dr. Paul is doing good work, and he's bringing people into the libertarian movement. You can't help but help someone like that. When Dr. Paul was a libertarian candidate for president in 1988, he came in as an elected Republican. He's a wonderful man. He's got terrific family. I've known his family for years and years. He runs for office, and at the end, he's got this stunned look like George Foreman at the end of the, the rumble in the jungle after Ali clocked him. Like, what happened? I went to dinner with he and his wife, Andre Maru, our libertarian presidential candidate that year, and Andre's wife, Ellen, and me and my ex-wife, or as I call her, the woman with my money. <laughs> she's, one, she's actually terrific. And I asked Dr. Paul when we were at dinner, I said, Dr. Paul, what was the biggest surprise about running for president as a Libertarian Party candidate? And he, he had this look of like disappointment, like a man who had seen something and didn't like what he'd seen. And he said, well, you know, as an elected Republican congressman, all the doors were open to me. I could go on talk radio shows and they loved me. They were generous to me. They were sweet to me. They asked me softball questions. They let me go on at length, which is good for me. And he said, but when I became the Libertarian Party candidate, those doors closed. Those invitations dried up. The questions got more and more attacking, smearing, and vicious. Oh, you Libertarians, you people uh, believe in the private ownership of nuclear weapons and raping chipmunks, right? That's Sean Hannity's question. And Dr. Paul was really surprised at the number of genuinely abusive questions there were and mean-spirited, cruel things 
that were done to him that were never done to him, a man who had not changed his views one iota since being a congressman. And he said, people don't realize how hard it is to run for office as a Libertarian Party candidate. I'm here to tell you something. I've been to the Republican and Democratic trainings where their professionals teach how to do stuff. There's a lot of good material there, and I'll be the first to tell you. I know a number of people who are Republican operatives and Democratic operatives, and when they're not near a voting booth, they're wonderful people. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, they don't realize how hard it is for a third party. We are like Rosa Parks, not just being shoved to the back of the bus, we're being thrown under the bus as candidates. Now the reason I'm telling you is that when you tell people, hi, I'm running for office, what's their first question almost always? Exactly. Which party, Republican or Democrat? Do I look brain damaged to you? <laughs> I'm neither. And it, but it's, it's the strangest thing when people think of what your choices are. They think, which do you want, Republican or Democrat? And Libertarian is new to them. They're not negative on us. They just don't know us. Libertarian Party candidates have troubles that Democrats and Republicans don't have. That's true of getting on the ballot in your state. How many of you had to petition to get on the ballot? How many of your state had to petition to put our presidential candidate on the ballot? That doesn't happen to Democrats and Republicans. They got people that do that stuff for them. Their parties are very often grandfathered onto the ballot. They don't have to do any part of it. So I'm here to tell you, I have walked in your shoes. I've been a candidate for office three times. 1976, I ran for U.S. Congress as the Libertarian Party candidate in Tucson, Arizona, in Arizona's 2nd Congressional District. 1998, I foolishly answered the phone one day, picked up the phone, and my state chair was there and said, Hi, Michael, I need a little favor. And like an idiot, I said, Oh, what's that, James? And he said, We need a candidate to be on the ballot because if we get 1% of the vote for U.S. Senate, we keep ballot status. Is that true in some of your states where if you get a certain percentage, you keep ballot status? Well, I was busy helping Mark Hinkle raise money for the California party. I was busy launching Carla Howell's campaign for Senate. I was busy with the Harry Brown for President campaign and had no spare time. But since I was only going to have to put my name on the ballot, I said, sure, I'll do that. So I wrote the check, $1,000 out of my own pocket, didn't ask anybody for anything, put my name on the ballot, and then I got the call. You remember, Michael, when we told you we weren't going to ask you to do anything? Yeah? We lied. <laughs> and I said, OK, what do you want? And they said, you like talk radio. Would you be willing to be on it? I did some talk radio. I got on the ballot. Didn't do much. Christian talk radio, right-wing talk radio, ended up getting 2% of the vote, enough to stay on the ballot. Right. Oh, that wasn't the fun part. Harry Reid that year but won against the Republican by 401 votes. And I, they said, was the spoiler. Now, I want you to realize something. You've, at the guy who was running the political seminar earlier in the week, Chuck Muth, he was the guy who was, him and his friends were attacking me for being the spoiler. They called up talk radio and referred to me as Judas. You would have loved that. When they called up and said that I was Judas because I caused the Republican to lose, my first question was, do you really believe that John Ensign is Jesus Christ, our Lord? Well, it's important to get an understanding. But understand, I, it, I know it's tough to run for office. And I ran it a third time against John Kerry in 2002, got 378,000 votes. That's an easy thing to do if no Republican files. That's my secret for that third one. I've launched campaigns. I've, I've, I've launched four presidential campaigns. I've worked with candidates all across the country. I've worked with state, local, federal. I've been a member of the Libertarian Party. I want you to know something. The work you're doing, I've done before. I respect it. I honor it. I know it's hard. And I want you to know that if you say, Michael, I had a rotten day, and I say, tell me about it, I've been in your shoes. I understand, and I care. So when I call you on the phone and offer to help, it's not some guy who's never had it hard. 
It's from a guy who's had it as hard as you had it. I want you to know, I'm in your shoes. I'm you. I just wanted to begin with that because I want everybody to get it. I don't like people coming in who have never experienced the trouble we have and say, let me tell you how easy it is. You don't know how easy it is. You don't know how hard it is. You've never been there. So let's talk about money. Money is good. I hate it when people go, you know, money isn't everything. That's true, but poverty is nothing. <laughs> you know what? I've noticed something. My banker, when I leave my bank account empty, won't clear my checks. Companies that print campaign signs won't accept checks from empty accounts. Have you ever noticed this? But money is more than money for a campaign. Let me tell you why money is important in your campaign. Money pays for your campaign literature. Money can help you put door hangers on with the world's smallest political quiz, and a lot of people will self-identify libertarians and ask for more information. Money will help you print your leaflets to hand out. Money will help you get on a radio show, a TV show. It'll help you buy advertisements. It'll help you print handouts that you can give door to door as you campaign across the neighborhood. That money gives you a chance to amplify your message and get it out. That's the reason the first 10,000 is vital, but it's not the most important reason. The most important reason to raise money is everybody who gives you money is now invested in your campaign. They will read your literature, even your mother. They will listen to your talk radio. Honey, I saw you on TV this morning. You look so good in your suit. My mom called and told me that when I was 50. <laughs> I was pleased as punch. It was just a great day. I used to believe that when people are committed, they'll contribute. I believe that commitments cause contributions. And that's partly true, but the flip is true too. Contributions create commitment. If you can get people to donate even five or ten dollars to your campaign, they'll become more involved. They'll become more interested. They'll read your material. They'll come to campaign meetings. They might even run for office later. They might even join the Libertarian Party. That's why your fundraising is important. Does that make sense? Now, here's my deal. If you like what we do today, I don't have anything to sell you other than a book. I don't have any $20,000 contracts. I'm not going to charge your credit card. But I'm going to ask you to do a couple things. I'm going to ask you, once you learn this, to share it with another libertarian in your area. The more of us that get good at this, the better for the whole party. If you bring in 100 new libertarians, and you bring in 100 new libertarians, and you bring in 100 new libertarians, we all win, don't we? When anybody wins, everybody wins. That's why libertarian campaigns are important. I'm going to tell you something that people don't like for me to say because it ticks off the bigger candidates. The presidential campaign this year is not nearly as important as your campaign for local and state office. Your campaign will build your local and state party so that after the campaign, you can grow and do more. What's more, the better you run your campaign, the better it is for our presidential candidate. You benefit him. It's not the other way around. In the Libertarian Party, influence percolates up. It does not trickle down. You are the key. Now, that's a powerful position, isn't it? And the great news is you can't fail. If nothing happens, are we any worse off than we were before? If something small happens, aren't we a little better off? And if something big happens, aren't we way better off? That's what this is about. That's what the fundraising is for. And I get kind of excited about it because most libertarians don't like fundraising. I found a way to help people grow spiritually through fundraising. <laughs> it's, it's like sitting under the Bodai tree at gunpoint. <sighs> I'm going to recommend a few books for those of you who, who say, I want to do it, but I'm, I'm scared about this, or I don't know how to do this. So I'm going to recommend these books. I use every single one of them. They're easy to read. 
None of them are libertarian books, except for my two. One is a, a book written by a wonderful woman. It is called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. It's written by a psychologist named Susan Jeffers. And she helps people grow through their fears. I know it's scary to run for office. How many of you have walked your precinct, knocked on a door at least once? Are they going to be mean to me? Are they going to say bad things? Is the lady going to be in a towel? <laughs> no, she's not. You can put away your letters to the editor. Feel the fear and do it anyway is about how we can get over the fears that we have about asking for money, campaigning for office, asking people to be involved with our campaign. And it's called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, Susan Jeffers. It's available. You can buy it used if you want for a couple dollars from a local bookstore or online from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or one of the other great vendors. The second book is a book that I recommended to Bob Johnston. I had forgotten I'd recommended it to him, but he didn't forget because he got it. It's a book called Ask for the Moon and Get It. And if you won't only read one book on fundraising, this is the book that can make the difference for you. Ask for the Moon and Get It. It was written by Percy, P-E-R-C-Y, Ross, R-O-S-S. -S. The book is out of print, but you can get copies real cheap, a buck or two bucks, on Amazon.com. Go to, go, go to the book, click, go down on the right side where it says used copies, and look, you can get very good copies for a dollar or two dollars, plus the shipping costs. Buy it. You will never regret this book. Am, am I right, Bob? I've read it three times. He's read it three times. But he's a slow competition. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these libertarians, ain't nothing for trouble. Now, the third book is a book called The Aladdin Factor like Aladdin and the Magic Lamp. And it's written by Hanson and what's Jack's last name, the chicken soup guys? Canfield. Canfield, thank you very much. It's written by Hanson and Canfield. It's out in paperback, you can buy it new or used. Both those two books, Ask for the Moon and Get It, and The Aladdin Factor are about how to ask for what you need for your campaign, whether it's volunteers, whether it's money, whether it's guidance, whether it's assistance, when I don't know how to do something, you know what happens in my house? I pick up the phone and I call up someone who knows. And if they don't know, I say, oh, okay, do you know someone who might know? Well, no. Do you know someone who might know someone who might know? And invariably, I'll get one or two people, and sooner or later, I'll say, hi, I'm Michael Cloud. I'm with the Libertarian Party. You were recommended to me as being an authority on this. Could you teach me something? And the person goes, well, what would you like to know? I've had very well-to-do people spend an hour on the phone with this guy that, who they had never met because I asked them. And I learned how in Ask for the Moon and Get It. This is a great book. And it's, it's written so simple, you're going to look at it and go, no, that's too simple. Couldn't work. Yeah, it works. Now, how many of you are active in your state party? Okay. There's a wonderful book for state party fundraising. It's called Relationshift. This is a very small book, Relation Shift, S-H-I-F-T, one word. And it's written by Bassoff, B-A-S-S-O-F-F, -F, and Chandler, C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R. And it's how to shift the relationship for fundraising for your organization. And if you're in a church and you want to use it for your church, it works there too. It's great stuff. Now, I could recommend the others, but frankly, they're both mine. So I'm going to go right to the what do we know how to do. And we're going to do the fundraising. OK. Now, if I break a few rules in here, there's a reason why I'm going to be breaking the rules. Most people get really uptight about fundraising. I like to make it fun. If you're not having fun doing it, you're doing it wrong. Or you're getting down on yourself. Because fundraising is really fun. When I ask someone for money, I don't have a nervousness problem. They do. <laughs> I don't have an unsure how to answer problem. They do. But I will help them get out of that quandary. I will help them write that check so they can feel good. And I'm going to tell you exactly why they're going to feel good. They're going to feel good because I've done them a favor. 
fundraising from your family and friends. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to build a list real quickly from people you already know. These are people, and the words are, they know you, they like you, and they trust you. And by the way, that's reciprocal. You know them, you like them, and you trust them. These are the people in your life. These are the easiest people in the world to talk to and the scariest people to talk to. If you've ever run into financial problems, asking your mom for a loan is worse than going to the principal's office. The first big question people have when they ask about fundraising is, who do I ask for money? Even if I told you how to ask for money, wouldn't you ask, well, who do I ask? Well, just go out and cast your bread upon the waters. Which water, what bread, where do I go? Who do I ask for money? And what I do is I build up a real simple list. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. So if you've got your pen and paper out, first thing you do is this. We're going to make a list of everybody in your life. First person is your family. Write down your mother's name, your father's name, your brother's name, your sister's name. I think I walked off without it. Oh, no, there it is. If you're married, now, by the way, this is every living relative you can remember. Your mother, your father, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma, your grandpa. If they're alive, write their name down. Okay? That's the first list. Don't worry about anything at this point. You're just writing the names down. I'm not asking you to ask them for money yet. That'll come in a minute. Then you write down if you're married. How many are married? Raise your hands. You have in-laws. You thought your in-laws were a problem? No, they're a solution. You're going to write down your mother-in-law's name, your father-in-law, your brother-in-law. They're finally going to be proud of you. I will help you help them. Someday they'll thank you for this. Not today, but someday they will thank you for this. Now, you've written down the names of, and I usually take a yellow legal pad. My mother's name, my dad's 87, Edwin G. Emerling. My mother's name, Janelle Cloud Emerling. My brother's name, asshole. My sister's name, Janine. Everybody's got a brother or sister that they think is a jerk. My brother thinks I'm a jerk. He's mistaken. I think he's a jerk. I'm correct. That's understandable, isn't it? Okay. And you write down the names of your family and friends. Then you write down the names of your in-laws, your brother-in-law, your sister-in-law, your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, even if you're on bad terms. It's really fun to fundraise from them if they're annoyed with you. I'll show you how to do it. Actually, it's actually fun for them because they get a chance to give you a little bit of grief and you get a chance to smile and laugh and take their money. <laughs> now, you've listed family, you've listed in-laws. Who's next? Friends. Everybody that if you were in jail in Tijuana and you picked up the phone and said, can you come get me? They'd come get you. You're not so hot friends or people to go, ooh, it's a long way down to Tijuana. I'm going to miss you. <laughs> Write down the names of all your friends. Now, I like to do some others, and these are, they don't have to be people you see every day, but they're your friends. You, maybe you haven't seen them for a while. Maybe you talk to them once every three months or four months. Maybe they moved away. Maybe you used to hang out. But people that you'd been tight with, people you'd been in their life and they'd been in yours, okay? Next, organizations you belong to that are not the Libertarian Party. If you're a member of Mensa, you're in trouble. If you're a member, if you're a Trekkie, they dress weird, but they donate, believe it or not. I've had, I've had Trekkies give to my campaigns. <laughs> and I was glad to take their money. Now, so everybody who's in your life at some point, they're your family, your friends, your organizations you belong to. Are you in a church? If you're in a church, almost everybody's got a place they usually sit in church. Who do you sit next to? Write their name down. Who's on the other side? Write their name down. Who's behind you? Write their name down. Who's your favorite usher? Write his name down. Who's your minister? Yes, I'm going to have you ask your minister too. Because he knows it's better to give than receive. <laughs> now, oh, believe me, when I use that line on, on a minister, they go, oh, man, 
hoisted by my own petard. Now, let's go a little further here. Okay, you've got family, friends. Now, let's go people who spend money with you. If you're in a profession, if you've got a small business, if you're an independent contractor, who are your clients? In my case, I'm a speechwriter. I have clients all over the place. Usually I do the work with phone. I usually do it with professionals. It's not usually politics. It's usually he's a brain surgeon, he's an osteopath, he's a chiropractor, he's a, an attorney, he's this, he's that. People who spend money with you if you have your own business and they're spending money. What if you work for someone instead and you're not sort of an independent contractor? The people you do not ask, mark this down, do not ask is people who answer to you. People you have authority over. That's harassment. Don't you dare. Don't do it. People you're allowed to ask are people who are lateral to you, different departments that you know. Maybe you see them at the water machine. Maybe you talk at the sports bar afterwards. But coworkers that you're cordial with. And my favorite, your boss. This is almost as much fun as asking for a raise. And I've got about a 35% success rate with bosses, believe it or not. Now, this is people. First, I had said people who spend money with you. Then I said if, they, if you're not an independent contractor, people who work with you. Now, there's a, a group that money moving the other way. People you spend money with. How many of you have a cat or a dog? Come on. How many have a cat or a dog? Do you have a veterinarian? My veterinarian donated money to Harry Brown for president. Do you know why? We'll get back to that. Do you have a hairstylist? Do you have a chiropractor? Do you have an OBGYN? Women only. Guys, if you have one, you're weird. Do you have... Um, People who provide services, lawn services, not, not, not the guy who mows the lawn, the guy who owns the business. Do you have other people that you spend money with? And it used to be, you could also do video stores because they used to be little private businesses. But they can be if you've got a pool service that cleans your swimming pool. If you've got a regular um, garage that you take your car to and a regular guy. Anyone you spend money to is fair game on this. Okay. <laughs> Now, I'm not having to ask money. You can always mark out the names you don't want to ask, okay? So, no pressure here. You don't have to ask any one of these names. That's the first part of the list. Who do I ask? Now, why are they going to give you money? Two reasons and two reasons only. There's only two reasons that I'm going to have you ask them for money. And they both begin with the letter R. Their relationship to you, your relationship to them. Relationship is the first reason they're going to give you money, your campaign. And the other is reciprocation. I washed your hand, you wash mine. I scratched your back, you scratch mine. I scrubbed your back, you're on your own. Reciprocation. Now. We've got who you ask. I'm going to go how you ask in just a moment. I'm going to show you what to do and the easiest way to do it. Now, let me show you how not to do it. It's really important to know. If you want to screw this up, here's what you think. Wow, I should write them a letter. I've noticed something about letters. They're easy to ignore. They might have gotten lost in the mail. I think I read it. It's around here somewhere. Has anybody ever gotten a letter from someone letting them know about a campaign that they didn't read? Have you gotten any libertarian letters that you didn't carefully read? Like in the last year? <laughs> I got a whole stack of them before this convention. Thank God Western civilization was in my hands because I read them all. You're not going to ask for anything by mail. Mail is the easiest thing to ignore. What's the second easiest thing to ignore? Email. And if you really don't like it, why are you sending me that spam? Well, the spam company had a sale. I thought maybe you'd like some. 
Spam is the second easiest thing to ignore. The hardest thing to ignore is when you're there in person, but we live in a world where people are pretty spread out. Our family might live 20 miles from us or might live in a different city. Is, that, does your, is your family and friends kind of spread out like mine are? You know, it's a bit of a car drive. Okay, so the way I'm going to show you how to do it is over the phone. Now, some people get a little weird about making phone calls. They get, oh, it seems cold and impersonal. I want to show you something. I need a volunteer, you. Could you come up here? This is the way we did it in the military. I'd like you to walk up toward me until you start feeling uncomfortable, until you feel like we're inside each other's space. <laughs> I'm pretty close right now. <laughs> you want me to go further? Are you, uh, are you uncomfortable? <laughs> yeah. OK. Everybody's got a space. Men, women, have you noticed this? That you've got a space that if somebody gets too close, you start backing up, it looks like a waltz. And sometimes people want to get closer than you want to get, and then you're backing up, and it looks like a very bad movie. Thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing that. That's true when you're there in person. Somebody got a phone on them. Could you take it out of your pocket for a second? I don't, I don't need it on. Open it as though you're going to make a call. Pretend that I've called you. Do you notice how close I am to your face? Do you notice how it's almost sensual? Are you feeling happy now? I want you to notice how intimate the phone really is. Most of us are very, a lot of our phone conversations are more intense and more personal than our in-person stuff. Have you noticed that? The reason I like being able to use a phone is because people can be wearing whatever they want, they can be wherever they want, and it feels very personal because it's very up close. One other thing occurs on the phone, people focus more than they do when you're in person. Do you notice how we zone in and zone out when people are there? We look over their shoulder to see whether someone more interesting might be there. We look at their shoes to find out whether they shined them. We do all these weird things in groups. But over the phone, they intensely listen. Now, there is an exception that we all know about. When people have cell phones and they want to talk with you when they're driving or escaping a bank robbery they've just completed, they want to multitask, right? Have you have people do that? Have you listened to those phone calls? Yeah, uh, yeah that sounds good. Oh, yeah, sure, I, I think so. Whoa! You know they're not paying full attention. You can hear it in their voice, that kind of empty sound. I'll show you how to not have those kind of phone calls, okay? It's very important that we single task when we phone call. Okay. I'm going to tell you exactly the words to use, but I'm telling you that the most fun, have you noticed how some of your most fun conversations with friends have been over the phones? You, have, you share jokes, you tell them what's new. Oh, mom, you can't believe what happened. Da, 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 da. Or John, you can't believe what went on. And you tell a story and then you get off the phone. What's interesting is over the phone, if I'm doing a survey in person, a political survey, do you know the average length of the political survey before people get antsy? Four minutes. If I, hi, we're doing a political survey. It's totally anonymous. Would you mind taking a couple minutes to answer some questions? After about four minutes, he's looking to get out. Do you know how long people will give you over the phone for the same survey? Twelve minutes. It's a different culture. I just want to, this is not a matter of opinion. This has actually been tested by people in my business. So here's what I'm going to show you how to do. I'm going to show you how to get people on the phone how to have fun doing it, and I'm going to walk you through the whole process and show you how to do it. One, you write down the name of the person that you're calling. Why would I need to write it down? Because your brain will go weird on you when you're talking about money. How do I know? I did. I've had these idiot moments. Hi, Bill? Now, you've made your list. You've decided who you're going to call. I want you to set aside four evenings. 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of any week, provided Monday's not a legal holiday, okay? Never call on Friday, never call on Saturday, never call on Sunday. Friday, people are on their way out. They don't want to talk to you. They're going to a party. They're blowing off work. It's TGIF. Bad day for fundraising. I've tested this numerous times. Has that been your experience? Saturday, good luck on getting somebody. They're out doing stuff. They got family obligations. They're going to the movies, the Avengers on today. For example, if I weren't here, I'd be going to the Avengers because I like movies. Now, Sunday, some families it's okay, but some families it's an intrusion because it is their only time that they have together because they're working six day weeks to help support the fine government that Democrats and Republicans have burdened us with. That's why we do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Here are the hours to call, the hours that work best, between the hours of seven in the evening and nine in the evening. There are some people you can call earlier, but sometimes you're interrupting dinner. Dinner sometimes with different families between five and seven. Not all, but most. These numbers consistently come up. It happens with my family, your family. Has this been your experience? After nine o'clock, some people are on farmer hours. They get up at the crack of dawn for reasons known to someone other than me. If God wanted me getting up at dawn, he would not have invented noon. <laughs> I'm on the vampire shift. I'm telling you, me and Harry Brown and, and, and Murray Rothbard and Carl Hess, we were night guys. I love it. Now, seven to nine are your best hours. Here's what's interesting about it. You're going to make your calls. You're going to be able to make each call in less than seven minutes. Seven minutes is about all it really takes because... The pitch isn't really hard. Now, anybody who misses any of these notes, I have good news for you. If you give me your email address, I'm going to mail you a complete, elaborated, filled-in script of everything I'm teaching you plus more. I want you to take the notes today, but I also want you to have fallback. So I'm going to send you a complete PDF in case you forget anything, okay? If I say it wrong, don't worry, I'll correct it in the written form. <laughs> Here's what I did to my mom. So you get an idea. And remember, my mother thinks I'm clinically insane for being a librarian party candidate. <laughs> Pretend you can get them on the phone. And by the way, I'm going to tell you how to leave a message if you get an answering machine. You're going to love my answering machine stuff. I torment people on the answering machine. They can't resist calling me back. How many of you have left messages on machines and never had people call you back? Mine is 98%. It's actually 98.1, but I didn't want to brag. <laughs> you get them on the phone, and my mother picked up the phone, and she, I said, hi, Mom, this is Michael. And she goes, oh, hi, son, how are you? I said, Mom, I've got great news. Your son, the boy you gave birth to, the young man you raised, the boy you taught values to, is running for United States Congress. Isn't that wonderful? Well, that is very nice, son. I, I think that's really great. Mom, I had such good news. You were the first person I thought to call because you're my mom. Mom, could you put $250 into your son's campaign? The pauses you're hearing are the same pauses my mother heard. <laughs> and she goes, well, um, now the hard part is shutting up. And then she goes, Okay. She said, who should I make the check to? And I said, well, why don't I let you go get the checkbook? And it should come out, Michael Cloud for U.S. Congress. And it was in 1976. It's 250 bucks. That's like 1250 today. I want you to know. That was a serious amount of money. But she's my mom. And she finished, and I said, you got it all done? I said, Mom, I thank you so much. When other people are asking me, How's the campaign doing? I'm, I'm going to be able to say, my first donor was my mom. And I want you to know you made a difference. 
can I talk to dad? <laughs> I could not make this up. And I'm going to ask you to do this too, by the way. And my dad comes on the phone and I do the same thing. Dad, I have terrific news. Your son, the boy you mentored, the boy you turned into a man, your son is running for U.S. Congress. Isn't that great? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. And I wanted you to be among the very first people I call because you're my dad. My dad said, oh. And I said, would you donate $250 to your son's campaign for U.S. Congress? That's exactly the silence I got. Then my dad says, <clears throat> well, um, what are the issues? <laughs> dad, there's only one issue. Your son is running for office. <laughs> Would you like to get the checkbook now? And my dad said, let me see your mother. So I'm waiting. He comes back, and he says, I've got the checkbook. He fills out the check for 250 bucks. I've got 500 from my parents. My parents make Scrooge McDuck look, look like he squanders money. Okay? Now, my parents gave me money, and something amazing happened. They started reading my libertarian stuff for the first time in their life. They had never shown one inkling of interest. Every time I had a newspaper article, I'd clip it out, photocopy it, send it to mom and dad. Thank you, you made this possible. And you, you, if you saw the essays, Tony Nathan knows the kind of articles we got back in the day, okay? 1976, libertarian candidate for US Congress comes out for full rights for homosexuals. I came out for gay marriage freedom and gay men and lesbians to serve openly in the military service. I'm, I'm military. My dad's military, grew up in a military family. I know people who are gay. And I thought patriotic gay people should be able to serve too and be able to be married. I sent that to my dad, who has never even considered the issue. And I said, thank you so much. This is a, an article I got. Then another one where I call for a non-interventionist foreign policy and bringing home the troops. My parents read it. I sent them the essays that I got from Roger McBride, our presidential candidate, about turning America into one giant Switzerland. My parents read my libertarian materials for the first time ever. After I was done raising for my parents, I called my brother. Both my sisters, I talked to my in-laws, every single one of them I asked. And about 40% of them said no. And that's okay. It's their money. I understand it's a request. It's not a demand. It's not, I'm not like the government. Give me your money or I'll break your legs. No. 40% said no. And every time they said, look, I'm, I don't donate to campaigns. And I said, I understand that. Wouldn't you like this to be your first? <laughs> I don't care what they say. By the way, I'd write that down. I never donated to a libertarian. I've never donated to a political campaign. I understand. I respect that. But couldn't this be your first? Or, I understand, wouldn't you be willing to make an exception for your brother-in-law? All I'm talking about, it's not about issues, it's about relationship. Now, every one of those people had asked me for money for goodwill, for, for cancer research, for breast cancer, for you name it. I had donated to their church. I had loaned them money. We had relationships. I'm not putting the arm on them. I'm asking them to recognize that this is the same thing as any other relationship question. My brother-in-law was helping down in Haiti after the big earthquake. He asked if I would sponsor 
some of the lumber to help build a home for a family. And I said, of course, how much do you need? I wrote him a check immediately. I'll run for office again. I'll get it back. Don't worry. <laughs> now, the point is, you might hear it and go, and you're kind of laughing because you're nervous about it, aren't you? That sounds gutsy and nervy. Here's how you learn to do it. You practice it. You practice the script in front of the mirror again and again and again and again until, until you get to a point where it's very normal and natural for you to say it. The first time an actor rehearses a play, do you think the line sounds normal and natural? No, it sounds stilted. It sounds canned. It doesn't sound real. But I always refer to the relationship. Your son, the boy you raised. I don't just stop with your son. Your son, the boy you raised to be a man. The boy you taught to ride a bicycle. The boy who, whose wrestling matches you came to whenever you could is running for Congress. Isn't that terrific? Sometimes we forget that very few Americans ever run for office, and it is a big deal. It is a big deal. You are doing a service to our country, especially as a libertarian. That's a service. Let me test this. Sometimes we think that we're imposing on people. Do you feel like that a little bit with what I just did? Feel like we're imposing, right? Let me ask you this. If you could go out and inflict freedom on everybody, <laughs> would it be a hardship or would it be a blessing? We've got to really realize that if liberty is really as good as we say it is, we're doing everybody a favor by radically reducing their, their tax burden, taking it down from 47% to something so small they can pay out a pocket change. Taking government out of their business, out of their church, out of their family, out of their retirement, out of their children's schoolings, out of their lives. Don't you think that's valuable? I'm telling you why it's valuable. You are doing them the most blessful thing a human being can do. You're freeing these people. That's what we're doing for everybody. We're not taking from them. We're giving them. I'm real clear. When I'm raising money for the Libertarian Party, and people say, I don't like begging, my answer is, I don't either. But I'm perfectly willing to ask for money for services. You're paying money to a Libertarian campaign so our candidate can go out there and communicate your Libertarian ideas the ones you would communicate if you had the time and energy. Money for services. You're providing a service. I want everybody here to get really clean about the value that you're giving your family. That's the first value. Is they would be better off if they were free, radically better off. Agreed? Let me ask you the second question. Would they be better off if they discovered that liberty was what they wanted all along through their association with you? Wouldn't you love to be the person who opened the door to Ayn Rand and Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises and Dr. John Hospers and Tony, I loved his book. It's wonderful. Wouldn't you love to be the person that opened the door to their first libertarian experience in a positive way? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? I've seen college kids. I remember what it was like the first time I read Ayn Rand. You could see the light bulb on my, above my head. And it wasn't no 20-watt George Bush light bulb. We're talking neon, big, honking. We're talking, we're talking those, those spotlights. I got it. Do you realize that both of those values are possible because you ask them for money? And they're likely to occur. Now, that's the way you ask for friends or ask for family and friends. When you ask friends, I do it real simply. Say I'm calling a golfing buddy. Now, I've never golfed in my life. It seemed like a good walk spoiled, as Mark Twain said. It just seemed like an insane idea to me. I, if I want an ulcer, I want to give them. I do not want to get them. Now, when I call a friend, suppose I'm calling a friend that I, I'm a golfing buddy. Hey, Jim, Michael Cloud, how are you? What's going on? I had some good news, and I figured if anybody needed some good news, you the man. Your golfing buddy, the guy whose butt you kick every weekend, is running for city council. Is that cool or what? Hey, that's really neat. 
I just wanted you to be one of the first people to know because we're pals. We've done this together. And that's why I want you to put $100 into your friend's city council race. Will you do it? After I ask, I want you to do X, will you do it? That's a phrase you want to learn. Saying I need money is not a request. A request has a question mark at the end, which is like a fish hook, only it's far harder to be released from. Now, what I do is I state my relationship. Jim, you're, hey, John, your friend over at the Civitan Club, the guy who sits next to you, keeps borrowing the pepper shaker. I got great news for you, and I thought, I want to share it with you. Can you handle some good news? You don't have a heart problem, do you? Well, no. I could cause one if you want. No. Great news is I'm running for County Board of Supervisors. Isn't that great? Wow, that really is great, was his reaction. I wanted you to have the chance, the opportunity, to put $100 into your friend's city, uh, County Board of Supervisors race. Will you do that? Now, I've only asked the question once. You'll end up asking it three times. Here's what will happen. With about two-thirds of your calls, they will bring up objections. I'm going to teach you exactly how to handle them. You're going to write these down word for word because they are brilliant. When someone says, wait a minute, you're running for Congress, I've got a concern. My first words out of my mouth are, oh, tell me. And they go, blah, 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 like the teachers in the Charlie Brown cartoons, wonk, 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 wonk. And they tell me what their problems are. And here's my answer. Here's my rebuttal. Oh. Write that down. Oh. And then I say, is there anything else that occurs to you? As a matter of fact, there is. Wonk, 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 wonk. And objection, objection, objection. Oh. Now, the third time, I break out the heavy guns. He brings out a couple more objections, and I go, uh-huh. Now, write that down. That's U-H hyphen H-U-H. Then, is there anything else? And if he brings out his last one, I go, ah. Right, that's the third. O, uh-huh, and ah. Now, the Oz has got three H's. Thank you for asking that. Now, why, what am I actually doing here? I, I, I actually have a motive in my madness. I'm not being a smart... Well, I am a smart ass. Okay. But the truth is, they're not objecting. They're thinking out loud. Do you ever think out loud and you just burn it up? Blah, 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 blah. I do that. Do you do that? Okay. Lots of people do. They're not arguing with you. Do not help them argue with you. Wow, that's really interesting. Great. Now, after you go, uh huh, uh huh, and they've done that, then you say, I get that. I write that down. I get that, or I see. Either one. What that means is I listen to you. I heard you, like the Japanese do when they say hi. Hi means in, in Japanese means I hear you. Doesn't mean I agree with you. Doesn't mean I approve of what you said. It means I heard you. I recognize what you said. I acknowledge that you said it. I heard it. I see. Or, oh, I can understand that. That's another way of saying it. I could understand that. But, John, I'd still like you to put $100 into your friend's U.S. congressional race. Will you do that? Second request. I was asked three times. Postman rings twice, Michael asks thrice. Then the hard part, shut up. Whoever talks next is the one who's going to be moving the money to the quiet one. Be the recipient. Be the glad person. And understand what this is about. This is about them helping you help them. If you had a friend who had a smoking problem and you could help him stop, and save their life, would you do it? If you had someone addicted to heroin and they ask you to help them get off the stuff, would you help them? You're helping 
to free them of the disease of big government and make their future bright and possible. That's what this campaign's about, and this is why I get excited about campaigns. This ain't mercenary. It's not about the money. It's about, I want you to be free. I want to dance at the first libertarian presidential inaugural. Wouldn't you like it? Wouldn't you love to be invited? You'd frame your ticket. You'd have tours in your home. Yes, as a matter of fact, he's a personal friend of mine. Matter of fact, even ask me for money. <laughs> That's how trustworthy your friend is. You'd have tours of your house. But here's the, here's the truth. Okay, you got the person, you ask a second time, and sometimes they'll go, I just can't do that, or I just can't do it. People talk in vague ways about money. Take the amount you ask them for, whether it was 500. By the way, here's the amount to ask for. Figure out what their income is. 1% of it is the amount you want to ask for. It's, it doesn't bust the budget. It doesn't scare them too much. If they make 50000 500. If they're making 50000 you ask for 2000 they won't give a larger amount. They'll just shut you down. They'll think that you're nuts. And, and you will be. But that's all right, because we love you anyway. 1% of their income is about what you ought to do, given the limits that you're allowed to do, and each office is different. So if you're running for federal office, it's 2,500 for the primary, 2,500 for the general, and in bribes, totally unlimited. <laughs> okay, now let's, let's go to the next part where they say, I just can't do it, or I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. And you'll get that about half the time, sometimes two-thirds. And the first words out of your mouth should be, okay, I understand. Because you do understand. It's their money and they have every right. And then the words after I understand, if 500 is too much, how much would you be comfortable writing me a check for? How much would you be comfortable giving? And I ask that. I, I give that, by the way. I mean, in fact... I've got someone who asked me for money, asked me to help with this campaign, sitting right here, and he knows. He asked me to help with this campaign, and I didn't have time, so I gave him extra money. That's normal. People do that. Sometimes they'll give you less money, and they'll say, could I volunteer? Believe it or not, we've had family members volunteer. And while they're there, they'll talk to other libertarians and find out you're not nearly as strange as they thought. Okay. If 500 is too much, if 100 is too much, or if you want to use the phrase, if it's too much, or say, if that doesn't fit your budget, but repeat the number you asked. Do not lower it. If 500 doesn't match your budget, how much would you feel comfortable giving me? Your son. Oh, I say that repeatedly. My mother says, you know, guilt doesn't work. I said, Mom, you're absolutely right knowing that they had just given me 500 bucks. Sure, it doesn't work, Mom. I learned from you. I learned from you. Okay, now, when you're done getting the check, ask them to fill it out right now, put it in the envelope, put the stamp on it. Could you put that in the mail tomorrow? I want to make sure that we get our paperwork filled out right. Is that okay, Mom? Wonderful. The day that they tell you, like, for example, when you're done with your phone calls for the night, the first thing you do is something Ruth Bennett did here at this convention. You send a thank you card for their donation, even though you haven't received it. Thank you so much for sending your donation. You really made my life, made my night. Thank you, Mom, your son, Michael. I send that in the next day's mail. If they forgot it, they're going to send it when they get the thank you note. I don't, I, and, and it's literally, sometimes people do forget. They're not bad. They just forgot. Stuff comes up. It happens to all of us. Now, if you get it after like three or four days, whatever the mail takes in your area, then I send a same thank you card. Mom, I got your donation today. Boy, you brought a smile to my face. Thank you so much, your son, Michael. You can't overthink people. And most of us forget to do that. And for the record, thank you for being candidates and thank you for being here. Now, that sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Simple doesn't mean easy, does it? So I'm going to tell you how to make it easier. And I'm going to teach you how in the phone thing, but I want to break you in on a couple things. First, 
when you learn these script lines, there's a reason why I phrase words in certain ways. Because I've tested them. I found out what didn't work. And what didn't work, you throw away. I said there are two reasons people give. One is relationship, the other is reciprocation. You go through all your relationships and all you do is state your relationship. Your golfing buddy, your friend, the guy you sit next to him is running for office. Isn't that great? You need to start taking the attitude that it's great that you're a libertarian candidate. I'm here to tell you it is great. It is an honor to represent liberty. It's an honor to have a chance to change the world and to restore the Constitution restore liberty and take America into the 22nd century as a freer, better place. Isn't that an honor? Wouldn't you, if you had a chance to sign a new Declaration of Independence that would launch this and people could see it 200 years from now, that you were at this libertarian convention, at this activity, and that you made this difference, wouldn't you feel good today knowing that people 100 years from now are going to acknowledge and recognize the commitment, the investment, and the wonderful impact you had. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Now that's the way you do it with relationships, but let me kick it back to reciprocation. Everybody I spend money with, let me tell you the story of my cat, Cyrano de Bergercat. I, I, this cat adopted me. Never ever feed a cat who comes to your door, right? Is that the first rule? I knew the rule, but he was so cute. And he was so skinny. And I had some tuna in the fridge, so I figured, cats like tuna. He liked it so much he stayed. <laughs> I would take Cyrano when I was on the road with Harry Brown for the first presidential campaign, and I would board him at my vet's place because I didn't have someone who could come to my, my apartment and take care of him. But they had really, really big cages, and they let him go out and play with little kitties, and he was great. And I finally looked at my vet bills and how much I had paid him for boarding and how much I had paid for my, the feline leukemia shots and this and that and the checkups. And I realized that in three years I'd, or two years, I'd paid my, my uh, veterinarian something like $1,300. So the next time I came in, I had fun. Dr. Johnson, you know, when I've come here, for two solid years with my cat Cyrano, I've come because I love the service you guys have given him. You have the best veterinary assistance. I love it here. And my cat likes it too. He doesn't get, you know how some cats get crazy when you're going to put them in the cat carrier? He knows he's coming here and he doesn't get crazy because you guys treat him right. I want to thank you for that. You're probably wondering why I'm always gone. Yeah, he's never wondered that in his life. So I help him. You're probably wondering why I'm gone sometimes and need to board Cyrano. I'm working with a libertarian presidential candidate, Harry Brown. He's a financial advisor, he's a best-selling author, and he's a terrific man. You'd really, really like him. I'm out on the road with him working to fundraise and build his campaign for president so voters have a real choice instead of that dilemma on election day. Pretty neat, huh? And then I said, I was noticing the bills that I've spent for the last two years, and I've spent $1,200 with my cat, and I'm glad because you guys are worth every penny of it. And I expect in the next two years to spend another $1,200. And I thought, you know, I spend money with you. Why wouldn't you spend money with me? Notice what I just said. I spend money with you. Why wouldn't you spend money with me? Or I give money to you. Why wouldn't you give money to me? Believe me, if you've got a look on your face of shock, that ain't nothing compared to what Harry had when I told him. And I said, I was wondering whether you would do me the honor of being my first veterinarian to donate to my candidate. <laughs> and my vet looked at me and he says, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I love that. I had all my examples ready. I, was, I, had, my, I had my, oh, uh-huh, uh, I see. And I didn't need any of it. I felt so cheap, <laughs> just used. Anyway, he said, how much would you like? And I said, well, actually, I would like $2,500. That's the legal limit. And you could give another $2,500 for the general. But I'm guessing that that might be a little higher than you were thinking when you said, what would you like? Am I right about that? And he said, Yep. 
And I said, would I be out of line if I asked for $24.99? <laughs> or would you prefer that I ask for something like maybe $350 or $4? And he said, I'll give you $300. I said, that's wonderful. Got out his personal checkbook, filled it out, Harry Brown for president. I said, you know what, I'm so proud of you. I'm going to get you an autographed copy of his book. I really appreciate it. I came back, made a special trip to see my uh, veterinarian. I gave him the book autographed personally to him by Harry Brown. I said, I held your book as Harry Brown was autographing it. <laughs> came back to the vet's office two weeks later to go out on the road. Guess what I saw in the waiting room? In one of the glass cages was Harry Brown's book with a note, Harry Brown for president, above it, printed out. If you would like a copy of this book, ask the receptionist. He had read it cover to cover. He had re-registered a libertarian. Now, that was a weird situation, but he had been a conservative his whole life, and he recognized that we were offering the real McCoy. Now, what I did is I talked about the reciprocation. That's the most important part. I want to make sure I don't overdo it. I'm going to take five more minutes, and I'm going to bring up my, my partner here. Uh, Bob Johnston works with the Libertarian Party to, to help people keep their memberships current when they forget and let them lapse. He won't let them collapse. He helps them jump right back in. Now, what I do with the person is I tell them the rela our reciprocation. Here's what I've spent with you. I notice you're my dentist, like I have a dentist, and I say, I noticed that I spent X number of dollars with my teeth for the last two years, and I thought, oh my goodness, I spend money with you. Why wouldn't you spend money with me? And most people are stuck for an answer to that one, so they go, oh, what's that? And then I give them an opportunity. Your client, the man who spends money with you, the man who loves your dental work, is running for office. And I'm wondering, wouldn't you like to be my first dentist who gives $100 to my campaign. Would you do that? And by the way, my reciprocal relationships, I have about an 85% response. And there's a reason why they give you money. And it's not blackmail. It's a, Harry says, you're already getting full value because they've transacted, they've given you what they want, and you've given them what they want. And I said, yes, Harry, but there's an economic value in repeat business, in being a relationship rather than merely a transaction. Shall I walk you through it? I read about it from this guy named Harry Brown in this book called You Can Profit from the Coming Devaluation. And he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> They'll give you money because you are a valued customer, not because you're blackmailing and you should never do that. The fact is, a lot of them will read your stuff. A lot of them will ask you about your campaign. They'll talk about it to their receptionist. Next time I came in, she goes, oh, you're the libertarian. I said, yeah, I am. I said, would you like to be one too? Or do you need a note from your mom? <laughs> and she said, I don't need a note from my mom. I'm over 21. I said, let me see your ID. She said, you're hitting on me. And I said, no, you're too young for me. And I said, would you like to meet my nephew? And she said, how old is he? I said, he's 22. She said, yeah, OK. <laughs> All right, so they're given for the relationship or the reciprocation. Now. I told you that I was going to tell you how to guarantee they call you back on the phone because you're going to get a lot of busy signals. You're going to get a lot of people where you leave a message. That happened to you? You call for somebody, they're not home, they got an answering machine on. By the way, I'm going to send this to you in writing, so in case you forget it, this is buckets of fun. You never call, most people go, uh, hi, this is Michael. Uh, I guess you're not home. Yeah, oh, that was a secret. Uh, could you call me back? You got to give them a reason. You want them to think to themselves, oh my God, I'm bleeding profusely. Oh, but Michael's got a message. <laughs> you want it to be a quandary. Now, here's what I usually do when I don't get you on the phone. Hi, this is Michael Cloud. I'm calling because I have a question that only you can answer. If you would, would you call me back at 520-886-6881? I'm calling because I have a question that only you can answer. The question is, how much are you going to give? <laughs> the question is, would you like to help? 
That, who else could answer the question for them? Now, you might think that's disingenuous. I've never had anybody said, you said I had a question only I could answer. And I said, well, who else could answer the question about whether you want to help? And they said, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. It's, 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 I'm not trying to trick them so much as I'm trying to help them grow spiritually. Now, <laughs> now second version, this is different. Hi, John. This is Michael Cloud. I decided to pick up the phone and call because something happened today that made me think of you. When you get a chance, would you call me back? Well, what made me think of them? My campaign. <laughs> the fact they would be delighted. The fact that even the newspapers don't know I'm running yet. Hey, I'm keeping it a secret. You're one of the first to know. I haven't even told the newspapers. Haven't told the TV stations. And the internet is uniquely unknowing. Now, I'll guarantee you that all that does is kick everybody's curiosity button. What is, what's the question only I can answer is, is the first one. The second one is, what made them think of me? The answer is, I thought they had a checkbook. <laughs> I thought they would be interested. And by the way, I tell that as long as you're having, if, if you goof on it, people are okay. You just called to ask me for money? No, I called because I know you, and I could ask you for money. I didn't just call a stranger. <laughs> and, and they go and start laughing. People, when people laugh, they give you money. Is this not true, Scott? When people are laughing, they give you money, do they not? When people are laughing, they take off their clothes when you're dating them, and that's as good. This is good. This is good. Now, if they point and laugh, not so good. I'm sorry. I'm really going to get in trouble later for that. Okay. There is one third thing that I, I just couldn't resist and that I will pop this. Um, a last way of leaving a message, they have to call you back. You leave an associated reference, somebody they know and like and trust. If you're calling your brother, you talk about your mom. If you're calling your mom, you talk about your brother. Hi, Mom. This is Michael. I just got off the phone with Fred, and I have a question I'm hoping you can answer. Could you call me back at 520-886-6881? And my question is, is Fred going to be alone in donating in the family? Or couldn't you help too? Now, by the way, some people call that shameless, but I don't have anything to be ashamed of. I'm helping them be free. Here's what happens after they give you money. They get really interested in your campaign, they start reading your libertarian literature, and they start respecting your political beliefs. They don't look at you like you're some kind of Martian or freakazoid. I've had that happen with people who used to make fun of my campaigns. I did it to a well-known conservative commentator who just passed away. And I got this guy. I couldn't get him to write over the limit. He wrote a check that was under the reporting name so no one would know he gave money to Harry Brown for president. But a famous conservative, social conservative, gave money to Harry Brown for president, and it was the sweetest $199 I ever got. <laughs> now, the purpose of this is real simple. I want you to succeed. The purpose of this is I want you to be able to raise enough money to build our party. I'm making a project at this convention. I want you to be part of it. Now, you see how, the, how I'm approaching this? I'm making it fun, aren't I? I mean, if this actually happened to you, would it be fun? Some of you are going, I don't know if I can do that. He seems like a jerk. Yeah, okay, so I'm a jerk. Okay. But you could do it anyway. I don't know if I could do it. He seems like an extrovert. No, no, no. I'm a vert. There's introverts, extroverts. I'm right in the middle. I'm a vert. Anybody can do it, even if you're shy. Before I leave, I want to leave you with one idea. You said, but... I learned a few things, but isn't there more? There's always more to learn on this, and I'm going to show you more in the paper stuff. But I wanted to show you that this isn't complex. This is not rocket science. Even a Republican could do this. <laughs> well, if they got a little help. This is something that it, it doesn't require you to be a scholar. It doesn't require you to be some silver-tongued devil. I had one client of mine is a stutterer and did this over the phone. 
And he had people finishing his sentences and writing him checks all afternoon. And he ran for office. He was in California, and he's a wonderful, wonderful libertarian. I don't know if he's still out there. I'm telling you, anybody can do this. And if you would like to be part of this, here's the project. I want 100 of us to join me. I will send you the materials, all the scripts, the lines. If you want to practice with me, call me up. We'll schedule you. My charge to you is very simple. The price is you do the best you can on your campaign. That's all I demand. That's all I ask. If we can get 100 people in our party to do this this year, it will be $1 million more for our party. And every dollar of this money comes from non-libertarians. Would you like a million more dollars advocating our libertarian message? Would that be cool? I'm going to bring my partner up here and let him tell you a little bit about phone fundraising. On a scale of 1 to 10, how many found this simple enough that you think you could learn to do it? Cool. I want to help you. I want you to do well. I have a selfish motive. I think our party can really start taking off this year again. I think we can grow ourselves big. I think we can blow some people's minds. I think we can put the word spoiler back into the lexicon. I think we can elect some libertarians. I think we can win some people to office. And I want you to be the guys and gals to do it. Thank you for your time. I hope you don't mind if I sit. I had a late night at the crap table last night. Ugh. My name is Bob Johnston. I am the chair of the Maryland Party. I have also been uh, doing this, working for the LNC for just under two years now, since July. Like you, I started from scratch. I've never asked, done any type of fundraising before. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in this time, I've spoken with thousands of libertarians. I've raised over $170,000 for the party. Thank you. And I would say my conversion rate with those with whom I speak on the phone is almost 50%. Almost one out of two will renew their memberships. You don't have to lie. You don't have to be, you can just be yourself and do this. Um, number one, know what you want and be, make it succinct. Know what you want, why you want it, and make it succinct. Now that may sound obvious. You are besieged daily by hundreds, if not thousands, of marketing ads and messages, television, radio, email, internet, newspapers. You have about 15 seconds to get these people's attention, to tell them why they should donate to your campaign, your ballot access, your state or national party. You have to do it without hesitation. I keep it simple and succinct. Mr. Cloud, we were just calling to let you know your membership at the LP uh, expired last month and just wanted to see what we could do for you to come back and renew. Wow, I didn't know it expired. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, um, and then, like Michael said, shut up. Yeah. What do I need to do? Uh, I can help you over the phone right now if you like. If you're comfortable, we can do it by credit card. I can mail you something. I can email you something, whatever works for you. Can you email it to me? I'll get it out tonight. Thank you for renewing. And that's it. Number two, Michael was talking about the book, Feel the Fear and, and Do It Anyway. What is your biggest fear and how will you deal with it? You're going to deal with, I'm talking now more about cold calling than what Michael was talking about with the relationships. You're going to be hung up on, as some of you I'm sure have hung up on me. You're going to encounter some rude people, but not as many as you may think, and you're going to get quite a few no's. What is, the wor what is your fear? What is the worst thing that could happen? The first four people are going to hang up on me. The first ten people I talk to are going to say no. Imagine that happening. How would you deal with it? And then make that next call. Once you can handle that, what is the best thing that would happen? Suppose you raised your $10,000 in a week and you're running for office and all of a sudden your campaign and your face are on billboards. In, where I live in Baltimore, $10,000, it's an expensive media market, can get you a lot of cable television ads and radio ads. 
And all of a sudden, now that you're getting a lot of advertising on, people are starting to pay attention to you. Hey, uh, that senatorial candidate, Michael Cloud, the libertarian, is now becoming a factor in the uh, race with the Democrats and the Republicans. I've seen it happen in Maryland just by running radio ads. When I first started doing, um, uh, getting people to run for office in Maryland, I focused on what would it be like to see libertarians on the ballot and on television on election night. And it was worth it. And that's, take that good feeling of what you want when you get it and attach that to making the phone calls. Okay? Like Michael said about hours, uh, he said seven to nine, if you're making cold calls, I would even make it let earlier than that, 8.30, unless you know the people. Uh, two to four in the late afternoon is also good. Don't call on Sunday, don't call on holidays such as Monday. Uh, I haven't had much success calling in the mornings, just getting a hold of people. Uh, break down the cost. If you're asking for something, don't just ask, would you donate $100 to my campaign? I want to buy uh, 20 yard signs this week. Would you donate $100 to my campaign? I want to run $500 worth of ads on the local radio station. Would you donate $100 to that? Give them something tangible for that money just, instead of just asking for a, a significant, a specific amount of cash. Like Michael said, you need to close and you have to do this tactfully. If they say, yes, I would be happy to donate, you have a promise. You don't have a renewal or a contribution. Great, thank you for doing that. I'm going to be purchasing the ads this week. Can I count on you to send in your donation this week? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, if you're calling on people who you don't know, I'm not a big fan. I know some fundraising books recommend this. I'm not a big fan of uh, asking them how they're doing. Hi, Mr. Clown, this is Bob Johnston with the Libertarian Party. How are you doing today? He knows, if he doesn't know me, he knows I'm not calling to find out who he is. He knows I want something. I find it patronizing. So I would stay away from that. Speak at the rate that the person on the other end of the phone is speaking. Uh, coming from the mid-Atlantic states, I speak very fast. I have, to, I have to force myself to slow down. Finally, I would say test. Test different approaches. I would try something maybe about 50 phone calls. If you find yourself getting hum, hung up on or just getting no after no, try something different. For example, my first preference is to introduce myself first. Hi, this is Bob Johnston with the Libertarian Party in Washington, D.C. May I speak with Mr. Cloud? I found myself getting hung up on a fair amount, so I tried something different. Hi, may I speak with Mr. Cloud? Hi, Michael, this is Bob Johnston with the Libertarian Party in Washington, D.C. I don't know why, but I get a lot much better response to that than the first way, even though I prefer to do the first way. Also, make, wait until you get a response that he knows, he recognizes who you are before you launch into your, what you're asking for. So once he's, a, hi, Mr. Cloud, this is Bob Johnston with the Libertarian Party in Washington, D.C. Oh, hi. Hi. Just, wanted to let you know, blah, blah, blah. If he doesn't answer after about three seconds, I will ask, can you hear me? Sometimes people can hear you because of cell phone transmissions or I have a dead spot in my apartment or whatever. Um, and just make sure you get that response. And uh, so test, te you know, disregard everything I just told you and try what I said not to do and see what happens. And if you get a great response, please let me know. There's something, there's lots of stuff I can learn and we're all here for the same thing to advance freedom. So if you test something that works, you found a method, please let me know. This is a method that has worked for me. I've made, you know, spoken with thousands of people. It's something I'm comfortable with and I like the renewal rate that I'm getting right now. So um, would you like to entertain questions? Sure. Now, <laughs> I guys, uh, I, I have a mixed reaction when I talk with people about fundraising. I have a little bit of fun when I do it, and I'm gonna, the more comfortable you get with it, the more fun it will be. The more you do it, the more fun it will be. The first time you're a candidate speaking, it's scary. The second time, it's scary. We always have a little bit of nerves. That's our body getting ready. And I understand how some of this can seem a little scary. That's why I gave you my number, is because I intend to be your lifeline. 
I intend to make sure you succeed. If you're, I am willing to meet you as far as you're willing to meet me. Is that fair? And my motive is just real simple. I want to live in a libertarian America. And it's not going to get done unless we all do a little bit. And you have a role and I have a role. And if I can help you, I want to help you. There are people in our party who are great candidates. I want them to teach all of us how to be great candidates. Mark Hinkle loves this quote from uh, this old Chinese quote, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, feed him for a lifetime. If we teach each other how to fish, if we learn the skills in fundraising and uh, recruiting volunteers and being good spokesperson, presenting good libertarian proposals, we are taken more seriously. We will get the kind of respect that we deserve. And when we demonstrate that we know our stuff, you're going to get news reporters doing something like Reuters did the other day when they talked with Carla Howell. Oh, Miss Howell, it's a pleasure to talk with you. You might not remember me. I interviewed you after your first ballot initiative to end the Massachusetts income tax. Do you remember me, Miss Howell? And she said, to tell you the truth, we got a lot of calls then. And he said, well, it's really a pleasure talking with you. Now, have you ever had a reporter say, you might not remember me? I talked with you? They think you ought to remember them. That's the kind of credence that good libertarian activism does, whether it's Tony Nathan, whether it's Dr. Nancy Lord, whether it's Carla Howell, whether it's Harry Brown, whether it's our, one of our candidates this day, whether it's our national chair, Mark Hinkle, that's the kind of credence you bring to the game as you demonstrate you can raise money. Now, I told you that there were benefits of raising money, that people would read your stuff, and I promised you $10,000 you could raise. And again, I'm going to send you all the details that I did not fill in today. I lied to you. You're not going to raise $10,000. I'm going to double that before your campaign's over. And I'm going to show you how to get it again six weeks before the election with almost no effort. And it's going to come from the people who gave you the first 10000 because now they've got something invested in your campaign and they've been reading your material and better than 95% will give again six weeks before the election. So you're not going to have a million dollars for libertarians. We're going to raise two million. And those people, some of them will join the libertarian party, some won't. But all of them will give you more hearing and more respect for your ideas than they have given in the past. The news media, when they're determining who's serious and who isn't, look at your fundraising. They look at you in the polls. They look at your yard signs. They look at the crowds you're attracting. And all of that can be set in motion and helped by good fundraising. Good fundraising won't make a bad candidate good, but it'll get a good candidate the attention she wants and needs, right? So I want to encourage you to be the best candidate you can and get the funding so that people can hear you, encounter your ideas, experience them, have an opportunity to, to think them through. Your whole campaign is a seminar for liberty for your voters in your area. And it's an opportunity for them to make a commitment to vote libertarian for the first time. That money gives you a megaphone. That money gives you credibility. That money brings in your family and friends into your libertarian world. My favorite letter that I've ever gotten, I got from somebody in your state. Do you know Mark Sensi? Oh, yeah, I know Mark Sensi well. sent me the letter, and it was after the Harry Brown, the first Harry Brown campaign. Mark came to a fundraiser where apparently he gave me everything he had and needed gas money to get home, which I loaned him. I'm teasing, I gave him gas money. He gave the money to the Harry Brown for President campaign and he sent me a letter saying when I came to that event, I had budgeted 
$50 to give to Mr. Brown. That was all I had to give, I thought. And then I met you and Mr. Brown. And let me tell you, Harry Brown was the bomb. Harry was the best I've ever seen. And he said, and then I maxed out my credit card to you, which was 100 bucks he had left. And then when you did your sea of green, I gave you all my cash in my wallet. Are you ready for the last line of the letter? And I want to thank you for the opportunity to be part of this. Have you had anybody ever thank you for allowing them to give to your campaign? When we run the kind of good campaigns that all of you are capable of growing into and becoming Harry Brown in larval form and growing and getting better and better and better, you're going to get emails like that, and you're going to get people who are grateful for you giving them a chance to free America, make government small, restore the Constitution, and make this the America that we could have and should have. That's the end of my unpaid programming. If you like what I said, give me a little love. <laughs> now. Before you go, I, I have one capitalist act between consenting adults. My new book is out. It's called Unlocking More Secrets of Libertarian Persuasion. Some of you are going to think, oh, he's just selling the book because he gets money. I have signed over all my profits for this book to Advocates for Self-Government. Every dime, every dollar that you pay for this book will go to reaching out to students on campus with the world's smallest political quiz to bring them into the movement. You buy the book, and not only do you get the value of learning how to put together your libertarian ideas more powerfully, but all the money you spent will reach out and let us reach 20, 50, 100 new students to bring them into the libertarian movement. Is that a deal or what? Now, we only had 200 shipped in. We'd, we were just printed, and all of the rest of the books are still at the printer, but I had 200 shipped out here, so we have a limited number. They're going to sell out before the convention's over. I'm going to limit it to two per customer. If you want one for yourself and one for someone at home that would like the book, I'll autograph both of them, and we're going to go right outside to the advocate's table. They're $15 each. If you're not satisfied, I'll refund every dime you paid, even though I'm not making a penny. That's how sure I am that you're going to get good value out of what we're offering here. Does that sound fair? I want to thank you for your time. I want to, more importantly, thank you for being libertarians. You make me proud to be in this party. You make me proud to be a libertarian.